Welcome to a documentary of the CVE Escort Carrier. In the Atlantic Theater, the Escort Carrier served as training ships and plane transports. They provided valuable air cover for merchant ship convoys supplying our allies. They furnished air support for the Allied landings in North Africa. Their hunter-killer groups waged such an effective anti-submarine campaign against German submarines that all U-boat operations in the Central Atlantic were withdrawn. Although the CVEs in the Pacific began their service as plane transports, their role in combat operations increased as the war continued. Their squadrons flew countless tactical airstrikes in support of amphibious landings in virtually every island invasion in the Pacific while fending off attacks by enemy submarines, surface ships, and swarms of kamikazes. Six escort carriers were sunk during the war. Two were torpedoed, three were hit by kamikaze aircraft. The last was lost to battleship and cruiser fire. When the war ended, several CVEs transported prisoners of war and military personnel home from the Far East. A few saw service in Korean waters during that conflict. Eventually, all the CVEs were sold for scrap. Not a single one of the valiant little giants exists today. Wartime experience was underlining the importance of the aircraft carrier, but was also demonstrating that the powerful attack carrier was either wasted or inappropriate in many situations where some sort of carrier was needed. Different demands were being made for a great number of carriers, but clearly it would not be necessary or affordable to build a huge fleet of Essex-class ships. One need was that of fast fleet defence. What was needed here was a ship with the speed of an attack carrier, but needing only to carry fighters. Cruiser hulls were selected for conversion, but not the huge battle cruisers that had become Saratoga and Lexington. Flimsy speedsters, Cleveland class light cruiser hulls, were transformed into what became the Independence class carriers. With an aerial complement of 45 planes and a speed of 31 knots, they provided a strong protective umbrella for the battle fleet and the big carriers, who were able to send off their own fighters to cover the attack planes. Compared to the 27,000 tonne Essex ships, the Independents displaced only 11,000 tonnes. They did serve well in their niche. All nine were commissioned in 1943 and they served for many years the last U.S. ship being withdrawn from service in 1970. 1942. A little brother of the attack carrier begins to come off the ways in increasing numbers. The escort carrier, nicknamed Baby Flattop or Jeep Carrier, is about a third the size of an attack carrier. Carrying only 30 planes apiece, they give support in troop landings and also play a key role in hunter-killer groups that roam the mid-Atlantic to fight wolf packs of German submarines that are cutting the lifeline to England. Dan Gallery, now a retired rear admiral, commanded a jeep carrier in the Atlantic. For one long period, we were losing over half a million tons of ships per month. Altogether, we lost several thousand ships. The uh, shore-based airplanes we had early in the war were not uh, long enough range to reach all the way across the Atlantic, and so there was a so-called uh, mid-ocean gap. Our CVEs came along and uh, closed that gap up. When they did, the, the CVEs uh, really made a shambles of the Sun Fleet. Carriers were also needed in great numbers for a range of humbler but no less critical roles. Remote islands needed new planes delivered. Assault craft ferrying men to the beach needed to be kept free of air attack. Convoys needed fighter protection against submarines and long-range bombers. Obviously, a carrier plodding along with a convoy did not need to be able to do 30 knots or deploy 100 planes. But equally as obvious, there were a lot of convoys. The United States Navy commissioned over 80 escort carriers. More were built for the British and other navies. 
Despite being known as baby flat tops or jeep carriers, these ships made an immense contribution wherever they were deployed. The first were converted merchantmen, but soon hulls were being laid down as escort carriers still basically built to freighter designs, but urgently needed to carry planes. There were seven different classes of US escort carriers, but all tended to be around 8,000 tons, restricted to under 20 knots in speed, and deploying around 30 aircraft. The escort carriers in the Pacific spent a lot of time carting aircraft to various islands. The distances involved were way outside the range of most of the planes, and the only ways to shorten those distances were to move the airfield nearer, use a carrier, or disassemble the plane, put it on a ship to be reassembled before use. The latter was, of course, impractical in a battlefield, and the arrival of functioning planes under their own power was far preferable. Here, as the convoys prepare to set sail for the invasion of the Marianas, Squadrons of Air Force P-47 Thunderbolts are loaded onto two of the Casablanca-class carriers. The invasion of Saipan would see some of the bloodiest fighting of the war dragging on over three weeks to secure an island of only 72 square miles. The air cover and air support for the troops would have to be initially provided by the fleet carriers. But to tie them to a beachhead not only robbed them of their lethal maneuverability and attack, it also made them relatively static targets. It was essential that planes be deployed from the island air bases as soon as possible after the invasion which is where the P-47s on the two escort carriers came in. They were to be flown to Saipan as soon as the airfield there could be captured and readied for use, and by doing so, release the fleet carriers to go about more appropriate duties. In later invasions, massed escort carriers would provide the air cover for the beachhead themselves. The expansion of American carrier strength is startling. In 1941, the fleet boasted a strength of seven carriers, six fleet carriers and one fairly experimental escort carrier. Three years later, in 1944, the fleet composed 13 fleet carriers, nine independence class light fleet carriers and 63 escort carriers. The total of 85 carriers does not reflect a strength of 85 Essex-class carriers. However, the presence of the escort carriers does mean that the 22 fast fleet carriers could all be available to act in attacking formations. The situation otherwise would have seen the power of the fleet divided into active and passive roles. The escort carriers had the effect of multiplying the force available for offensive action, cheaply and very quickly. zero but it could it could stay with it and uh, it was tough the new Essex class carriers which had been on the drawing board before the war start reaching Hawaii in May 1943 the Ford Island Tower greets one you look good out there honey the new ships become the heart of a fast carrier force screened and protected by battleships, cruisers and destroyers carrying thickets of anti-aircraft guns. The task force is organized in groups of three or four carriers, each of which can operate independently. At times, this awesome force will include as many as 17 attack carriers, stretching 50 miles across the sea, capable of putting more than a thousand planes into a single strike. No fleet in history has ever packed such a punch. 
A vast service squadron following in its wake serves as gas station, grocer, arsenal, and machine shop, enabling the carrier force to stay at sea months at a time. The enemy, often under simultaneous attack at widespread points, becomes convinced there must be two such forces. We encourage their confusion by giving the force two alternating numbers. It's called Task Force 38 when assigned to the 3rd Fleet, and Task Force 58 when it is with the 5th Fleet. It is alternately led by Admiral John McCain and Mark Mitchell, who is to be remembered as one of the Navy's greatest admirals. As we move to liberate the Philippines, the Jeep carriers have their finest hour in the battle for Leyte Gulf. Never intended for a major fleet engagement, a division of these midgets suddenly find themselves facing the big guns of an enemy battleship force. David was face to face with Goliath. Retired Vice Admiral J.P. Whitney was a Jeep skipper then. He remembers sighting the Japanese battle wagons coming toward him. They looked like pagodas walking on the water. Here they were, coming over the horizon, right straight for us. Well, there wasn't anything to do but to turn around and start running. While this was going on, of course, we were arming the rest of our planes. But in order to launch, we had to turn right back into the Japanese fleet again, because that's where the wind was from. Of course, all this time, we were under fire, you understand. On the uh, CBEs, we had one five-inch gun on the stern. Well, in order to maintain morale, we were throwing smoke at that time and everything else. The carriers launched their air groups to pound the enemy fleet from the sky. In the late morning, after we'd been under fire for over two hours, the Japanese admiral turned around and headed back. I read somewhere that he thought that he was running into the heavy, heavy carrier groups. And here we were, just little CBEs. The last spring of the war finds us on Okinawa, doorstep of Japan. In desperation, the enemy launches mass suicide attacks called kamikaze or divine wind for a storm that saved Japan from an invasion fleet in times past. In all, Japan sends more than 2,500 planes out laden with high explosives to hurl themselves down on the decks of the fast carrier force. Most are brought down before reaching their targets. Some fulfill the goal of the divine wind. The escort carriers were basically unarmored, built up on standard hulls. They were also slow. When the kamikazes entered the conflict, they often were attracted by these slow-moving, less defended and flimsily constructed ships. The little carriers suffered badly when hit. One theater that the escort carriers came to dominate was the Atlantic, where they became a key player in the war against the German Navy's submarine force. In a battle that was fought as hard and as closely as any engagement of the conflict, the fighting in the Atlantic seesawed over the course of the war with the U-boats seeming to have gained the upper hand for several periods. The introduction of the escort carriers had immediately served to curtail the activity of the long-range Luftwaffe Condors, which had been attacking convoys well out of the range of protective fighters based in the British Isles. The Condors had been very effective in their bombing and strafing attacks and had supplemented the work of the German main card, the subs. The overcoming of the submarines was to take considerably longer. As the escort carriers first came onto the scene, they operated, as their name implies, escorting convoys, physically trudging across the ocean in company with the mass of freighters keeping an umbrella of air power open. In this passive role, they suppressed the activity of the long-range bombers very effectively and did cause major difficulties for the subs, which were forced to spend a lot more time submerged. At that time, the major offence against the submarines was being taken up by hunter-killer groups of destroyers and frigates.
Later, as their numbers multiplied, the escort carriers became the core of a new kind of hunter-killer group. A circle of destroyers acting in concert with a baby flat top. The combination of planes with the fast and deadly destroyers was to be the final straw for the submarine offensive. Now, no matter where they were deployed to, in wolf packs or alone, they were constantly subject to interruption and attack from the air. And when the carrier planes appeared, the U-boat crew knew that the destroyers were not far away. In the right conditions, the thin distinctive shape of the submarine could be seen easily from the air, up to a depth of 60 feet. And the subs began to spend less and less time near the surface. Given the huge difference in the speed of a U-boat on the surface, as opposed to one submerged, the carriers, even when they didn't find and sink them, were radically curtailing their mobility and effectiveness. Much of the work of the little carriers was like that, Beside the radiant deeds of the task groups which fought epic battles over hundreds of miles of ocean, they were nearly invisible. Despite the lack of glamour attaching to the escort carriers, their contribution was enormous. The work they did was essential, and the work they did was very well done. Here is your ship, the USS Guadalcanal, fresh out of the Kaiser Yards. Equipped from stem to stern with the products of American ingenuity. Turned out by your hands. Electronic devices, radar, submarine detectors, wildcats and avengers, guns and shells. The thousand and one items that in the hands of American boys make a fighting American ship. All under the command of Captain Dan Gallery, USN, a pioneer of naval aviation. On May 15, 1944, a task group of the Atlantic Fleet heads out to sea with orders to operate against submarines to the west of the Cape Verde Islands. The group comprises the USS Guadalcanal and her five destroyer escorts, the Pillsbury, the Chatelaine, the Pope, the Flaherty, and the Jenks. At the departure conference, Captain Gallery and the destroyer skippers decide upon a daring plan of action. If, during this cruise, they can bring a sub to bay, they will not attempt to sink her as soon as she surfaces. Instead, they will spray her with small stuff, put crews over the side in small boats, and attempt to board and capture her. Daring, did we say? Fantastic is the word for boarding a wounded U-boat on the high seas. But the prize would be priceless. Naval intelligence could use a completely equipped enemy vessel. So during the voyage, prize crews were trained and rehearsed for this bold hope. Here's the hand-picked boarding party of the Guadalcanal. Let's meet some of them. Chief photographer's mate, Clifford Whirla. His job will be to get inside the sub, take pictures of all installations in case she cannot be kept afloat. Chief Pharmacist Raymond Jackson, Fredericksburg, Virginia. He served 10 years in the Navy. Lieutenant J.G. Milo Keck, a veteran sea dog with 25 years naval experience. Ensign Fred Middaw, an electrician's mate first class William Stein. Stein, a crack electrician, will assist Ensign Middaw in the job of checking the batteries and all operating motors of the enemy vessel. Ensign James Griffin, and machinist mate second class, Walter Waller. Ensign Griffin will check the sub's diesel engines. Waller is to be engineer of the party's whaleboat. In command of the boarding and salvage party is Commander Earl Trocino, engineering officer of the Guadalcanal. Over on the USS Pillsbury, a similar party is being trained by Lieutenant Albert David. On June 4th, 1944, the task group is searching for a sub reported 150 miles off the coast of French West Africa. When suddenly at 11.10... Frenchy to Blue Jay, I have a possible sound contact. Nothing startling for the moment. 
Possible sound contacts are made every day, but a flat top has no business near them. With her high freeboard and her thin skin, she is a sitting duck for any sub which surfaces within torpedo range. So the Guadalcanal swings away, while the two nearest destroyers break off to assist the Chatelaine, which has made the sound contact. And the Guadalcanal's patrol of two Wildcat fighters is ordered to the scene. Then Commander Knox of the Chatelaine announces, Contact evaluated as sub and making attack. Almost simultaneously, both fighter planes sight the long, dark shape of the submarine running 60 feet below the surface and sing out, Sighted sub! At this point, the sub reverses course, temporarily shaking off the destroyer. But the Wildcats can see the sub and reveal its position by firing their guns in the water at the spot where the sub is disappearing. This is a remarkable example of aircraft actually directing the attack of a surface vessel on a U-boat. At 11.21, the destroyer makes a depth charge attack. All ships are at battle stations, and all eyes are glued on the Chatelaine. The guns of the task group are loaded with anti-personnel rather than armor-piercing ammunition. At 11.22 and a half, the wounded U-boat surfaces right in the middle of the task group. Commence firing. The planes open up first. Now the blow really begins. Go right on, lad. The Nazis are scrambling overboard. There are the Nazis in the water in their rubber rafts. But there may be more on board ready for business. Away all boarding parties. The rudder is jammed, and she is running in a tight circle to the right. But the planes are all set to open up if she makes a false move. This is it. For the first time since 1815, the United States Navy boards a foreign enemy man of war on the high seas. The first boarding party has swarmed aboard. Only one dead Nazi on deck. There may be live ones below. But our lads tumble down the hatch and find to their amazement that the U-505 is all theirs. All theirs, that is, if she doesn't sink or blow up. Here comes the Pillsbury making knots. And there's a second whaleboat with a boarding party from the Guadalcanal. The Nazis have done a hurried, frantic job of scuttling. A solid eight-inch stream of water is pouring through an open stream. But Lieutenant David and his boys find the cover, slap it back in place, and secure it just in time. A few minutes more, and it would have been too late. The inrush of water is checked. Each man has a different job to do, has rehearsed it for months. And now that the chips are down, they come through. The ship is thoroughly searched. But she's still running wild, and the Pillsbury and more boarders are chasing her. Finally, the Pillsbury orders, Stop sub's engines. But when the prize crew complies, the subs sink so alarmingly that they throw the switches to full speed ahead, and the chase begins all over again. Meanwhile, the Chatelaine is busy rescuing some very wet members of the master race. Amazingly, 
All but one are saved and brought on board the Chatelaine. Dry clothing and cigarettes are passed around. The tradition of the sea is honorably and punctiliously respected. These men are the cream of the German Navy. They just can't believe that their ship has been captured and by members of a decadent democracy. At last the Pillsbury comes alongside and passes a line to the boarding party. A neat bit of seamanship. But watch out, that sub is still as dangerous as a wounded shark. She swings into the Pillsbury, and her bow flippers rip a long, underwater gash in the DE's thin plates, flooding two main compartments clear up to the waterline. The destroyer has to cut loose and back clear. The Pillsbury radios. Sub says she has to be told to stay afloat but we don't think a destroyer can do it. So the Guadalcanal heads over and says on the TBS, destroyers stand clear. I am going to take her in tow myself. Now we'll see whether this aviator skipper can handle a ship. It's a ticklish job hooking a flat top to a sinking sub on the high seas and in the middle of the Atlantic U-boat lanes. Look how far down she is. They've closed the hatch to keep the swells from pouring down on the boys working inside. If she goes down now, they all go down with her. Let's get that line out. There it goes, the messenger line with the big tow line at the end of it. This is a job to test the mettle of veteran seamen. And four out of five of those boys on the sub's forecastle are green. But there is no fumbling. The anxious skipper heaves a sigh of relief as the sub makes way and rises in the water. She is safe again, for the time being, and under a new flag. The task group forms up and on orders from the Navy Department heads for Bermuda, a grueling 2,500 mile haul with a riddled waterlogged U-boat in tow. Normal flight operations are resumed and carried on day and night, despite the greatly reduced speed of the Guadalcanal. At times, there are only 15 knots of wind across the flight deck, and it's axiomatic that a flyer has to have 25 knots to land on a baby flat top. But these pilots land anyway, and without an accident. are transferred from the overcrowded destroyer to the carrier. The one in the stretcher is Oberleutnant Dersi Herolang, captain of the U-505. The first man out of the conning tower. He was instantly blown overboard by a shell. During the voyage, they're brought on deck for exercises. And a thorough salt shower. Mm -hmm. 
On the 7th of June, the fleet tug of Naki joins up, and the tow is transferred from the Guadalcanal. Now comes the most anxious moment of the cruise. As she loses way, Junior, as the crew have christened the sub, sinks lower and lower in the water. The salvage party works desperately to take all movable weights out of the U-boat. Then, as the transfer is completed and the Abnaki gets underway, the clutches on the sub's engines are released and her propellers recharge her batteries. With power aboard, her pumps work once more and her tanks are blown out. Now she rides again at full surface trim. On June 19th, the U-505 was towed into Bermuda and there remains as a prize of war, one less wolf to hunt with the pack. Awards for Valor. About one third of the 84 escort carriers and their air squadrons in service during World War II and Korea were given distinguished awards honoring the outstanding heroism and performance in action against enemy forces. The Presidential Unit Citation was presented for outstanding performance in action against an armed enemy of the United States. The 16 CVE ships receiving the Presidential Unit Citation were the USS Bogue, CVE-9, USS Fanshawe Bay, CVE-70, USS Kitkun Bay, CVE-71, USS Petrov Bay, CVE-80, USS Santee, CVE-29, USS White Plains, CVE-66, USS Card, CVE-11, USS Guadalcanal, CVE-60, USS Lunga Point, CVE-94, USS St. Lo, CVE-63, USS Savo Island, CVE-78, USS Gambier Bay, CVE-73, USS Callanan Bay, CVE-68, USS Natoma Bay, CVE-62, USS Sangamon, CVE-26, USS Suwannee, CVE-27. The Navy Unit Citation was presented for distinguishing itself by outstanding heroism in action against the enemy. The nine CVE ships receiving the Navy Unit Citation were the USS Anzio, CVE-57, USS Macon Island, CVE-93, USS Wake Island, CVE-65, USS Chenango, CVE-28, USS Manila Bay, CVE-61, USS Bodawang Strait, CVE-116, Korea, USS Hogat Bay, CVE-75, USS Marcus Island, CVE-77, USS Sisley, CVE-118, and Korea. For the record, the participation of the CVEs in the U.S. Navy during World War II and the Korean conflict earned a total of 215 battle stars and 16 battle stars respectively. Some of these CVEs earned more than 10 battle stars. 16 CVEs earned Presidential Unit Citations, 9 earned the Naval Unit Commendation, and only 6 were sunk. The USS Guadalcanal and 5 destroyer escorts, U.S. ships Pillsbury, Chatelaine, Pope, Flaherty, and Jenks, sailing as Task Group 22.3 under the command of Captain Daniel V. Gallery of the USS Guadalcanal, captured the German submarine U-505. This was the first man-of-war captured on the high seas since the War of 1812. This capture included German code books, the Enigma machine, and charts which enabled our Navy to monitor the activity and eventually sink other German subs looking to destroy our merchant ships. Thousands of lives were saved. Tons of material and equipment to be used in the war effort would now reach the men who needed it. Does any other type of U.S. Navy vessel have such a record? The resounding answer is no. The German submarine U-505 has been restored and can be seen and boarded at the Chicago Museum of Science and Industry in Chicago, Illinois.